All right, welcome back to the Short of It on Zero's TV. I'm Tyler Neville here with Carson, Freddie, Dan, and a special guest afterwards. But we're going to be talking capital gains taxes, the SPAC implosion, and then we're going to bring up two specific companies that are in the crosshairs of short sellers. So let's jump right into it. Uh, what are you guys' thoughts on capital gains and how is that going to impact the short selling world right now? Well, first, I'd like to thank everybody for having me back after my unfair suspension. I feel like, you know, not swearing enough is no reason to suspend somebody. Uh, but, you know, fuck it. I'm back. That's that and, it's that and your looks. Oh, I didn't get that memo. Apparently, you know, the capital gains tax, I, I guess it's a good headline, but are we really thinking that it's going to, we're going to just double it arbitrarily from 999000 to a million, or is it? stepped up i mean this has been talked about being done before with everybody's money in the market because where else is it if it's not in the market real estate maybe your venture capital for very few this is going to affect a great deal many more people than we think it will and i don't think it has a, a prayer of passing well okay put, so putting aside whether it can pass or not i mean you know you say you think it'll affect many more people um than you know you expect it to. The percentage of American households who own financial assets is actually quite small. I mean, I I should have looked this up, but um, I want to say about ten percent um, of of households in America have appreciable uh, financial assets. So I don't believe that. Okay, well, what would your you know alternative reality be? My alternative reality would be something north of ten, give or take twenty percent. I mean, do you, do you really, I mean, how many people do you know don't have any kind of 401k, any kind of stocks? I mean, what, what, what's going on with the retail craze where everybody's opened up their own brokerage account? And you think that's only 10% of Americans? From perspective of has, you know, have financial assets received a massive government subsidy since the financial crisis? Yes. I'm, yes, they have on that. And that has. Um, you know, I mean, led to, I mean, that's been a significant contributor to inequality, economic inequality in this country and the bifurcation of society and the evisceration of the middle class. So if the complaint is, well, gee, you know, that's just punitive, I would say, well, you know, you've had this massive tailwind uh, because, you know, the economic policymakers have no better playbook than to pump up your house and your stocks. Um, I, you know, but I, I mean, there's there's a very fair question of whether the money is spent well on the other side of the ledger, you yeah. know, in ways that will actually um, address inequality or, you know, some other major societal issue. Um, yeah, I mean, that, you know, but that that's really a different question. I mean, they're very related. So as a U.S. tax payer who can't vote, um, I can only go with, with what feels good. And so on the basis that all of our gains are basically short term in nature anyway, because we're short sellers. And very briefly, when this was announced, the market went down for like maybe 45 minutes. I think this is great. And anything else that equalizes Leon Black's tax rate to mine and makes the market go down should be front and center of all policy decisions from here on out. Fair enough. Well, raising the capital gains tax rate is still not going to make up for your not having Jeffrey Epstein advising you on taxes, my friend. That's true. But in the spirit of Schadenfreude, anyone else getting feels good. Yeah, agree. The market goes down for five or 10 minutes. Why? Because nobody believes it's actually a tenable policy. Um, if they did believe it was a, it was an actual policy that was going to pass, it would, it would have much more of an effect on the market. And I agree with you. We already pay, you know, the, our, our, our marginal tax rate, right? So we don't really get the capital gains for what we do anyway. But for those who, who do, I think it's going to have a big effect on the market, especially with a buy and hold strategy. Like, why would you? Why would you hold? I don't think investments, investment needs any more tax preferences or encouragement at this point. 
you know, in the, you know, in our cycle here. When you step back and look at the, you know, at really the dysfunction in how capital is allocated. I mean, this is what we do every day. I mean, I've seen capital allocation be grossly distorted for years by these policies, even going back to prior to the global financial crisis. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like this, you know, equalizing the capital gains tax rate, um, you know, I, I don't feel like the country suffers for lack of investment. I feel like the country and the economy suffers for lack of productive investment. And, you know, maybe something like this will help make investors a little bit more selective um, in what they, you know, invest in. So, so we'll move on to the SPAC implosion. Um, we saw in 2020, $77 billion was raised in 228 deals. In 2021, there was $93 billion raised in 283 deals. And that basically happened all in the first quarter. In the second quarter, it pretty much dried up. It's like less than $2 billion, I think, in SPACs raised. And the premium on SPACs went from 27% to down to 2.2%. So what are your guys' thoughts there now um, in the market? I have a deli and I want a SPAC. I, I hope it really starts to turn around again. I'm all Deli's set for that. Delis have been done, man. That's very Q1. Uh, oh, right. I got gotcha. you. Somewhat similar to you know 2000, where you suddenly had this massive oversupply of IPOs. You've, you've reached a similar thing with SPACs. Um, you know, I, I question whether the timing in relation to the vaccine rollout and less retail participation. Um, and I wonder if one would have happened without the other, but it's kind of neither here nor there. Um, and then we're seeing kind of early stages regulation from the SEC who, you know, have looked at the car crash that have been the Michael Klein SPACs or, you know, Nicola's or basically the entire EV space and SPACs. And they're kind of cautiously now stepping in to regulate certain aspects of SPACs. The thing I find kind of unusual is what's staring everyone in the face is how egregious the forward-looking statements are um, with respect to these, you know, projections five years out. Whether it's XL Fleet Corp who have less than twenty million dollars in, in sales last year, projecting north of a billion in sales by twenty twenty three or twenty twenty four, whether it was you know Nicola just putting out projections of of a car. You know the the question for me is the SEC have, have stepped in to regulate and they've focused on the accounting treatment of the promote, and I don't think that was an area that people were particularly getting carried away with. And I don't think that was an area that was badly understood. Um, so I'm kind of surprised that that has been the initial salvo in terms of regulation. It's hard to regulate the, the speech components. I mean, IPO speech is, is very limited. Um, you know, I, I suspect that different courts throughout the years would have different interpretations as the constitutionality of the limitations on what companies may say when they're in the uh, IPO process. So I think regulating what they may say is, is, is probably treacherous ground for the SEC because should they try to clamp down on what these companies are saying um, during the pre DSPAC period, um, then, you know, or even shortly after despacking, um, you know, that could, that could lead to challenge and maybe even over, you know, and if the SEC lost, it might call into question a number of the other, um, regulations that the SEC has on what companies and, you know, may say and what they also must say. I mean, a portion of securities regs relate to compelled speech as well, things that companies must tell investors. So, um, it's there's probably a like a real issue at the SEC or I mean, look maybe I'm speaking out of turn here but um, with this idea of being aggressive about the about the speech now the the incentives um, I mean that you know the way that our system works is I mean it's reflective of this American ethos that America is a terrible place to be stupid um, 
And so the idea being that if issues are disclosed, like the incentives, then investors are able to decide. Um, I guess the problem is in, you know, in practice, retail investors are never in on the joke, right? They don't understand what the real incentives and disincentives are for the institutions that participate, that subscribe to the SPAC IPO, that participate in the pipe, get the warrants, et cetera. And it's just like IPOs. I mean, it's, you know, investor retail thinks that when companies are able to IPO, it's because you have all these, you know, smart money institutions that want to be married to the stock. When in reality, IPOs happen because a significant portion of institutional investors are just going to flip the stock to, you know, the greater fool who's out there in the market with a bid. So that's, you know, I, I guess that's the real problem is that retail doesn't understand the incentives and disincentives. And I think the SEC is really bad at explaining those things or mandating that they be explained or how they be explained, because, you know, it seems like the primary function of securities attorneys um, in this world is to disclose things in ways that nobody can understand or can stay awake for. And that, I think, is the core issue. Yeah, there's, there's a certain art, whether it's uh, in an IPO prospectus or another document, to burying the key bits of information deep enough in, surrounded by enough boilerplate language, that even if you're trying to stay awake and read the thing, your brain automatically switches off. So so how is that legal, like the Consumer Protection Agency? Like You, you, you have certain disclosures on say your credit card or things like that. How come that's not instituted in specs? I think that's kind of absurd. So really, when you look at legally, what what is a SPAC doing and what is the regime to which it's subject? It's like when Microsoft acquires Nuance, right? So Microsoft says, hey, we're buying Nuance Communications. This is why we're buying it. This is what our expectations of the future are, and this is pro-transparency. I mean, if you're talking about an operating business acquiring another company, you want that disclosure and discussion um, for the benefit of the investors. But when you have these non-operating businesses that are making these acquisitions, that is obviously different, but they don't have a regime that can really you know, differentiate between, we don't have a regime that differentiates between the two, because like I said, I. I suspect that on on some levels, the SEC would be worried about these regulations being vitiated by the court um, as infringing on First Amendment um, rights of the of companies. So if that were to happen, it would really open Pandora's box as to what else the SEC regulations in terms of disclosures they mandate or speech they prohibit. Like what else might run afoul of First Amendment, um, you know, the First Amendment? So I think, I suspect that that's part of the issue um, at the SEC. On the topic of disclosures and SPACs, Dan, why don't you tell us what uh, the guys over at Skills just disclosed the other day? Well, on the topic of SPACs, I just, to tell you the truth, I couldn't be more bored than talking about SPACs. It's just like, it's enough. But I'm never going to get bored of skills because they just don't disappoint. You know, as many people know, we put out a report on skills. It turned out to be timely. They ended up shortly after that pre-releasing their their Q1 uh, and just totally tanked on adjusted EBITDA, like doubled the loss there. And that's adjusted, by the way, so they can't even, like, figure out their own bull. <laughs> Great idea about skills this week is the lawsuit. There's trouble in paradise, right? The Paradise Brothers. Andrew, the one-of-a-kind, wonderful man running skills who everybody loves, uh, and Jeremy, his brother. Uh, apparently, Jeremy is suing his brother for fraud. What's a little fraud in the family? I encourage you all to go read this lawsuit. It's great fun. It really speaks to everything that I've, I've heard when looking into skills. I've really never heard of everybody I've actually talked to disliking a CEO so much. I mean, even the analysts think this guy's a douche. And if you don't think so, go look at the CNBC appearances. 
It's ridiculous. If I don't know if you saw them yesterday. What about the, the questions on revenue recognition, on, on accounting, comparing you to, to other frauds? What, what do you intend to, to do to respond to those? And, and are you considering legal action? Uh, we're not considering legal action at this time. We think the, uh, the reality of it is these short reports are without merit. And they arrived at conclusions that simply do not tie out against the business that we're building. We followed uh, a similar approach to other marketplace businesses, whether uh, Uber or Lyft more recently or others, which is really the comp set. The approach that we follow, it was uh, actually set up by Ernst & Young and then validated and reviewed by the SEC. Uh, I think the, the reality is these reports just simply don't understand the business that we're in. Yeah. And I think investors like Kathy have expressed that. What, what about the more broad uh, point or question, Andrew, that uh, most of your revenue by percentage uh, is sort of plateauing or flat versus, uh, you know, a much smaller percentage that is, in fact, growing very quickly? Is, is that a fair point at this stage in your life? I don't think it is. Uh, and uh, I can't comment too specifically as uh, we're in our quiet period right now. But uh, stay tuned until the next week, and uh, we'll be happy to share more information as soon as we can. It's it's a lot of fun to see. The guy's very, very impressed with himself, and apparently his brother, not so much. My favorite um, fact about the Paradise family is that Paradise is not the is not the original last name, right? No, it's Paradisi or something like that. I you know apparently the brother got in trouble like ten fifteen years ago, so. Changing a couple letters might have helped with that, but who knows? Or maybe they just like the sound of paradise. Uh, the only people that are really in paradise uh, where skills is concerned are Andrew and his cronies who are running skills. They're making hundreds of millions of dollars cashing in. Investors think they might. I disagree. And that thing's still a multi-billion dollar company, too. On paper, I mean, like uh, the market cap is multi-billion dollars, but look, you know, what we considered micro cap frauds 10 years ago are multi-billion dollar companies. I mean, what is it these days? So I'm not impressed. Uh, you know, what impresses me is profit, you know, continued revenue growth. And if you're going to make up your own EBITDA numbers, you probably want to go ahead and make those and not miss it by, you know, double digits. And then pivoting to another one of our favorite uh, companies out there is is GSX, who had an investor day recently. Uh, what are you guys' thoughts there at this particular venture? Who do you show clips from the investor day? This large round building featured our main office building. Our founder is Larry Chen. He founded the company on June 16, 2014, and has more than 30 years of experience in the education industry. Xiao Three PM Beijing time. Management speech on the way. <laughs> This thing was like, it was bizarre. So um, one of my colleagues sent me, sent me the link to click on it and I was a couple minutes late. So I actually thought it was the wrong link and I was on some like fantasy Chinese streaming thing because it, it was literally a, a dinosaur. Not unusual for you. No, although I don't log into my own account on a work computer for that stuff. So um, it's totally compliant what I do on those websites. Um, and if you guys want to visit my OnlyFans page, joking. Um, but um, yeah, so I, I actually thought it was the wrong link. So I, I went back and like pulled the correct link up and I was like, no, this this actually is someone in a kind of Barney the Dinosaur outfit talking to someone who allegedly works at the company with like English subtitles. On top of that, they've like totally changed the business model. Um, one of the key bull tenements, like, oh, this is actually growing really fast and profitable is, is no longer a thing because the SGNA like blew out ever since short sellers started targeting the business. Um, my, my honest, 
thought on it was, you know, up until they filed the 20F, I thought, you know, these guys are going out of business. They're not going to get the audit filed. And they were just sitting around the office kind of arguing over who's going to get to sell stock first. And one of them said, you know, the SEC, let's do the stupidest investor day ever. So we will be remembered for something spectacular. And, you know, after, after watching the investor day, there was something that kind of put a smile on my face. It was the thought that somewhere in the risk department at CS, there were like these four Swiss dudes who were going to be sat around. It would have been like 3 a.m. In, in Switzerland, logging in, getting up and being like, oh, we got a lot of risk on still in this piece of shit. Like, let's let's look at what the company does and seeing Barney the dinosaur talking to uh, talking to a lady on screen. But um. Turns out the joke was actually on us because they were able to file the 20F, which, you know, defies. Amazing. Eh. Yeah, but is it really? But yeah. I mean, look, I mean, it, in an even less than ideal world, yeah, it's still amazing. And there's nothing better than a China based <laughs> co investor day. I get it, they're fun. But 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 for GSX to be able to file and an auditor to sign off, it's just a new low bar every day. So there's there's one thing I vehemently disagree with Freddie on, and that is it was a Teletubby, not a dinosaur. <laughs> um, aside from that, we're pretty closely aligned. But no, I mean, look what obviously happened here. So if you look at GSX's twenty twenty F, and there was an audit matter. That was disclosed. And so, and you also see the audit fees, I think, were roughly double what they were the year before. Deloitte, in that disclosure, made clear that they went into the CRM system and they did a lot of work to make sure that, you know, the enrollments looked real and that inflow, they seem to be saying that they were making sure that inflows into the bank matched um, enrollments. And yeah, like, here's how and why sales and marketing expense went through the ceiling right after the after the short seller reports including ours so the company is obviously round tripping and it's beyond the scope of Deloitte's audit to look at the parties that were receiving the sales and marketing spend which I'm sure you know if you really dug in if we knew which com entities those were we could I'm sure trace them and make obvious links back to Larry Chen uh, the chairman and other GSX people. And so like, this is clearly being round tripped. And this gets to the, you know, the point that these companies from China have no place trading in the US markets, because China is a weak rule of law jurisdiction, like that's not a shocker, it's an emerging market. I mean, but de facto EM, FM, they have weaker rules of law. And China's it's particularly weak. And there's no comedy with the US. So you have no shortage of all of these par parties in China who are available to help you commit fraud because they're not, they don't worry about going to prison in the US. They don't worry about the reputations like, hey, yeah, we went to school back in the day and oh, I can make $100,000, which to you, you know, your stock's worth blah billion. You know, that's pocket lint to you and it's a lot of money to me. Sure, I'll set up some companies, help round trip the it's these companies from China are above the law. Like literally they are above US law. And we see this time and again. And if we look at the companies that we've written on since you know the last washout of these things in 2012, that Dan, you've written on, guys like Soren and Matt and others have written on. And I mean, there is a compendium of frauds you know, from the more mild, like 30% we're lying about revenue to, you know, we're lying about almost 100% of revenue. There's a compendium of these things that have not been erased, that where nobody's been held accountable and they've traded with real market cap for a while. And some, I mean, the market caps are much bigger than they were. This is, you know, and, and I guess if we really want to get into it, you know, why this is bad for America, because people would say, well, gee, you know, look at Tal Education, you know, you guys called it a fraud, which it is. I mean, it's a real business, but it's a fraud. 
And, you know, it's gone up. Isn't that good for American investors? And really, and maybe this gets a little too meta, but I think one of the core issues with the United States of America right now as a society is that we are, we, we are divorcing ourselves from the rule of law. We are unfortunately becoming more like places such as China, where there isn't a rule of law. And when you have in our capital markets, which is, you know, the lifeblood of our economy, when you have about 400 companies out of, I think, probably roughly 3,500 that are listed here that are above the law and everybody, you know, who's like, you know, looks closely will know that there's some real cheating going on there. That is deleterious to the rule of law in our markets and therefore deleterious to the rule of law in our society. That these companies have no place in the United States of America if they are unable to be investigated, let alone regulated. Speaking of which, if you look at the numbers, uh, we have a chart here that shows for the past couple of years, you know, Chinese companies have raised US IPOs and it's upwards of $6.5 billion now in 2021, which is just insane. Why hasn't anyone stepped in to do anything about this yet? Well, I mean, here, you know, here's the problem. And it gets to, I think, one of these fundamental questions about ESG. You know, the ESG proponents will say that, you know, the mark capitalism can fix the world's ills. You know, I'm not I'm not a Democrat um, anymore, but I got to tell you, there are situations in which the government must legislate or regulate to, you know, to stop. And because the investment banks sure as f aren't going to stop bringing IPOs from China, it's great business. And, you know, for for fund managers, especially long onlys, it gives them more dream to sell more financial product. Um, I, you know, so this, and I think that this industry, the finance industry is probably going to be the last industry that really decouples from China, if it decouples at all, uh, because the money that is made by Americans who have real influence and political power here is just enormous, but it is detrimental to our society. It is deleterious and it needs government action to stop this. And the other thing is, you know, when I've talked to people involved in China policy before, I mean, they really know nothing about finance and markets. You know, it's like guys like us um, don't go to Washington enough to talk with them. And, you know, and that was, I mean, to me, one of the really inspiring things about Dan's congressional run in 2018 was the U.S. government needs a lot more of this perspective. Um, financial markets, not just with respect to China, but in general. But um you know, unfortunately, that uh, wasn't to be for Dan. Well, look, I mean, it, when you're talking about like China as well, and your your question is, why doesn't somebody step up and do something about it? So I guess you're talking about the corporate side or the government. And the government nominally is doing something in a bill that's not very important in my mind as far as how strong that Kennedy bill is. Uh, but on the corporate side, China can be very punitive. You know, what are you going to do? Are you, are you going to be the one that's going to step out in front as a corporation and say, look, on behalf of American investors, we think human rights are violated. We think that there's no rule of law. There's no comity between the United States and, the, and, and, and China. And we're not going to invest there and see what happens and see what happens. They will openly say any business interest that you've had or do have in China, we're going to go after it. They do it for the biggest companies in the world, and they'll continue to do that. Yeah, and the and the amazingly sharp thing that China has done, I mean, I think this is really un you know undeclared government policy. And I you know, and I let me stop for a second just to point out that when we're talking about China, we're talking about the government of China, we're talking right. about the system that the right. government has created there. You know, the very small number of beneficiaries who list their their companies here. We're not talking about the Chinese people. All right. Yeah. So let's put that to rest. Um, should anybody wish to object? Um, the, but, you know, all these investments in Hollywood and the NBA, right. you know, I, I mean, they, they've bought off our cultural institutions. You, know, you go back to the Cold War and. Yeah. I mean, Hollywood churned out all kinds of anti-Soviet movies. Right. You know, the Soviets were the enemy. 
you know, like that helped rally the country behind, you know, behind that, that cause. I mean, nothing gets approved right now that for release in the U S without China, you know, China government censors essentially okaying it. Yeah, so, but, but that's, that's actually been a good thing for the Brits because it allows us to play all the bad guys in films. So um, it's, it's not been entirely a negative thing that, I mean, it's pretty uh, crazy the way they can have a blowback on U.S. corporations. Like, I don't know if you guys saw that essentially Nike and I think someone else stopped taking um, materials from Xinjiang and basically Anta, their sales just went through the roof because they they basically made it a national priority. So uh those also a short of ours, 2019. Yeah. It's done this. Yeah. Commits fraud, real business, commits fraud, and enslaves people. But hey, as far as Western portfolio managers are concerned, it's a buy, right? Because who gives a shit?